I think that the solution to the mind-body problem comes from first sort of taking a deep breath and then trying to adopt first the scientific perspective where we consider ourselves as animals, uh, mammals, primates moving around on a planet. In fact, you might actually take a trick from Descartes here, uh, who, who went, who, who, when he wrote about Le Monde, said, imagine a planet. And then he described, he said, oh, that's our planet. And so we could sort of imagine going to a planet and finding things that look like us. And so we're, we're, as it were, we're coming at them from the outside. And the question is, is there a mind-body problem? Do we discover the mind-body problem there? And of course we do, in a way, because we've got to interpret them and we, we've got to treat them heterophenomenologically. We've got to treat them from the intentional stance because they seem to be agents. They're, they're, they're fending for themselves very well. So we, we, uh, uh, we start uh, our process of interpretation First of all, we do the physiology and the physics and so forth, but then we still have this project of interpretation. And what we run into, if they really are like us, is that a lot of their behaviors include apparently communicating, and we learn their language, and so now we can really use heterophenomenology, and we can ask them, and we say, uh, tell us what it's like to be you, and they do. Now, the supposed hard problem arises when you think, okay, well, at least they're zombies. They, are, they, they're, they talk, they're intelligent. Uh, now, but are they like us? Well, in what regard? Well, is it like something to be them? Do they have an inner life? Well, of course they do. Listen to them. There's no question about that. Um, it recently occurred to me that uh, a very simple way of showing how strange the, the, uh, the confusion on this is, is to think of how 50 years ago, more than 50 years ago, um, Wilder Penfield in Montreal was doing surgery, brain surgery, on wide awake patients. You take the top of their head off, their scalp off, their, their skull, and they're sitting in sort of a, a chair like this, and they're wide awake with the top of their uh, skull off, and he's touching points on the cortex with electrodes and telling, asking them to talk about what's going on, and they say, and oh, there's a tune, oh, there's a, there's a, uh, and my fingers twitching, and so forth. I've actually shown, there's some film of that, I've shown some of this to some of my students. And thousands of people have heard about this and seen it. I've never heard anybody say, oh my gosh, well, there's nobody home in there. It's a zombie. Look, you take off the top of the skull, and it's, oh, it's just this brain. That's all that's in there. It's just too obvious that the people are conscious. And it would be just as obvious if we took the, if we took the uh, top of the skull off and we found it packed with, with transistors. I mean, uh, the, uh, there is a huge leap of imagination required to understand how a conscious life can be implemented in, in either silicon or in proteins. But it can, and, and in a way, Penfield's the, that's the proof of this right there. We, we, know that, we know that that's the machinery that does the job, and the idea that, that, uh, that there isn't a mind there, I think is actually subtly incoherent, because these supposed zombies, if you try to imagine a zombie, 
you have to remember that by mutual agreement, the philosophical definition of a zombie is somebody who's uh, behaviorally indistinguishable from a human being. In other words, he's good company. He uh, laughs at jokes and has preferences. And you can engage such a zombie in indefinitely iterated re recursive self-reflection. Uh, I recently wrote a bit which will come out in my next book where I invite readers, if, they're, if they really want to imagine a zombie, to read a novel by Jane Austen or by Nabokov or by J.D. Salinger and try to imagine that this is actually the novel, A Story of a Zombie. And uh, uh, I made a, a little discovery when I tried to do this myself. As you know, novelists have different perspectives they can adopt. There's one called omniscient author who can go into the minds of all the characters and say, and, and then she wondered whether and so forth. And then there's the first person uh, uh, narrative novel like, say, Moby Dick, where the whole novel is told through the mouth of one character, Ishmael, or The Catcher in the Ride, J.D. Salinger. Holden Caulfield is this teenage boy talking to you. And I pointed out that, curiously, a first-person narrative novel is easier to imagine as a zombie novel <laughs> than an omniscient author, because you're just seeing the behavior, you're just hearing the voice. <laughs> Whereas the omniscient author purports to be reading the minds of all the, of all the characters. And in fact, of course, the, the author is, we do read people's minds in that way. What, what, what the novelist does is only uh, a, an artful, extension of what we all do, namely we imagine what's going on in other people's heads. And we can test that imagining as, as exhaustively as we choose. That's what heterophenomenology does. And once we've got the science for how the brain makes each bit of that understandable, there's no more problem. Um, one time I had a very interesting discussion with Tom Nagel about this, Tom who wrote What Is It Like to Be a Bat? And he said, well, neuroscience could give you perfect correlation between brain events and conscious events, but it wouldn't explain the correlation. And I said, okay, let's explore that. Um, can you give me an example where it's not just correlation? And he said, yes. Chemists, physicists can tell you, as it were, why water is wet. The, the, the molar macro property of wetness can be explained, not just correlated with, but explained in terms of the bonds of the, of the water molecules and so forth. I said, okay, good, that's my... That's an example of explanatory correlation. And I said, now, how about when industrial chemists create a new polymer that's never been seen on the globe before? It's an artificial polymer. And before they've even made it, they're telling you what its tensile strength is, what its color is, whether it's going to be brittle or stretchy, and so forth. I said, you know, they can do that sometimes. I said, would that be explanatory? And he said, yes. I said, okay. Well, I think I, we've already entered the age of explanatory neuroscience. And I showed him the uh, Ramachandran and Gregory uh, uh, motion capture uh, experiment, where they predicted a brand new illusion that had never been seen anywhere before and they predicted it on the basis of their knowledge of the organization of the visual cortex. 
in terms of the blobs and the inner blobs and the parts that are, that are motion sensitive and the parts that are, uh, have, a, have a, 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 low, uh, a low spatial resolution. And uh, I said, this isn't that exactly analogous to what the chemists do. Namely, these folks knew enough about how the brain worked so they could say, we'll prove that we know how the brain works because we will put together a circumstance which creates an illusion never before seen and we'll predict it in advance. Yeah. So, I mean, that's why I think there's no hard problem. 